My name is Carolyn Crockett. I am an assistant professor of urban history, public policy and planning in the Department of Urban Studies in Planning. And I have been here now for a period of about eight or nine years, which is amazing because even though this is my first year, uh, the first year of my appointment as a professor, I have been here as a postdoc, I have been here as a researcher, and I've had um, quite a lot of work in and out of government. So in, in local city government, I was a director of economic policy for the city of Boston, and most recently I had an appointment as the um, city of Boston's inaugural chief of equity. So my time at MIT has been just really rich and valuable in terms of my own um, intellectual work, my professional work, my public service work, and it's been really wonderful to have it all kind of linked up together. So um, it's, been, it's been pretty amazing to be here. People Before Highways is my first book, so I'm pretty proud of that. And I always say to graduate students that, you know, the work that you work on in seminars and these little papers can turn into something and can have a life bigger than you, you imagine. That certainly was true for me. So uh, the story is, is uh, essentially about this 1960s social movement to stop the expansion of I-95 into, um, into Boston. And um, the odds are really stacked against activists and organizers um, from having any success in this effort, but they were successful. They were able to defeat the federal government's will to kind of make highways the, the law of the land. And they were able to uh, reverse the governor's position, sort of make him change course. And they changed forever the physical uh, landscape of the city of Boston. And not only did they do that by stopping the highway, but they were really successful in making sure that that land that was cleared was then used for new parkland, new public transit, new um, educational facilities were built on this land. So a really incredible vision for the future and really an incredible testimony to the power of advocacy, the power of regional social movements and the power to say no to something, but also bring with that uh, an ability uh, to envision a yes, kind of what is the alternative. And so, so much of what we think of when we think of what makes cities uh, amazing in this moment, uh, multimodal travel and transportation, uh, urban gardens, tot lots, sort of basketball courts, all of that was able to flourish in a part of the city that was really staked out for an eight to 10 lane highway. So it's an incredible story, um, not only of activism, but the way that policy can be formed and changed and redirected by uh, citizen, act citizen activists. And also uh, such an important story for the ways that students who are, who are planners, who are learning to be planners and designers to understand the role of, of, of everyday people and their own ability to articulate and advance new strategies for what they want to see for their communities and for successive generations. And so I thought it was really important that this story should be uh, documented and shared so that it could be in circulation, so it could be something we talk about and we teach about. And so um, growing up in Boston, this, uh, if, or if, even if you're here, if you didn't grow up here like me, you'll know something about this story. People are proud of telling the story. But what was interesting to me is that people didn't, there was not a full understanding of how it happened. And so people can tell you that there was supposed to be a highway here and it was stopped in 1969. Um, but if you ask them, well, how did people stop it? People will say, oh, they wrote letters, or they protested, they got together, they mobilized, and um, all that's true, but the actual uh, play of events, the actual actors who were engaged, it was a little bit more um, mysterious in some, in some senses. And so the opportunity to record that story and to hopefully add some sort of analysis and some contextualization so people could understand how stories like this were really linked up to many other um, social movements of, of the time and in, in the preceding times, the civil rights movement, the student movements, the anti-Vietnam War movements, um, the women's movement, all of these things were really bubbling and creating uh, new kinds of coalitions, new kinds of tactics that would be really instructive for some of the urban development 
um, and dreams and visioning that we would see in the 70s and 80s. And so there's sort of multiple knock-on effects from this moment and I felt like it was really important to tell that story because often when people are mobilizing for some kind of collective action, I think typically uh, those actions are not successful. Right? There's so many instances of, of movements or actions through history and even now where people come together because it's the right thing to do, come together because they feel morally compelled to do so, and uh, which, is, which is right. Uh, but the fact that you could come together to, to stop something and be victorious, I felt like there was a, uh, it was really important to document again how that happened. And so my book is a, is a modest attempt at trying to give us a sense of the plays, um, the strategies, the ideas so that uh, we can continue to learn from what these powerful movement makers were able to deliver.